Welcome to our fourth in a series of videos on truss geometry. <clears throat> We're talking again about a variation on our parallel cord trusses, in this case, self-bracing trusses. We'll look at two versions, mutually bracing planar trusses and tubular trusses, which in which the uh, two planar trusses or multiple planar trusses share a common cord member. So here we see uh, examples of uh, two vertical planar trusses, in this case variants of the uh, or mod modified Warren trusses. So here are the primary webs of the Warren truss. Here are those minor vertical struts which are helping to stabilize and support the top cord. What I want you to note here is cross bracing in every bay uh, to stabilize these trusses. This cross bracing might occur two or three or four times along the length of the truss. And it's, it's structural material that is not serving a primary spanning function. The load is being carried by these trusses and all this cross bracing is doing is keeping them stable and under the load. So in, in essence, these are these cross bracing elements are zero force elements under load. And as such, they're not very efficient, but uh, they're also not very attractive. They're sort of tossed in after the fact to fix some kind of a problem that wasn't thought through from the beginning. It is possible to consider the way in which we configure planar trusses or relate planar trusses to each other where they can serve this function for themselves rather than having this secondary bracing material to help keep them stable under the load. So here would be an example. We have a planar truss here which is a sort of classic Warren truss and another planar truss there. And if this plate connecting them together is a stiff enough plate and the welds are deep enough here, then what happens is the tendency of this planar truss to be unstable in this direction is accommodated by this truss. So this truss is strong in this plane, or in other words, against forces in that direction. This truss is strong against forces in this direction. And when we connect them together, they become mutually bracing, which eliminates the necessity uh, for any kind of additional bracing material. And we have a similar kind of con connection that occurs up above in order to help stabilize these trusses. Because this cord member and that cord member are distinct from each other. I'm referring to these two trusses as mutually bracing, braced trusses. This is another view of that same space. Now, we can do mutually braced trusses that are fully integrated and we'll refer to these as uh, tubular trust systems. So here we have a bottom cord and we have two top cords. This is a plane of material which can resist gravity loads. And on the other side, there's a plane that consists of that cord in this web and this bottom cord. And those two trusses, um, are mutually bracing, but in addition to that, they share a common bottom cord. So this cross section is a tubular cross section, uh, a triangular cross section for this tubular truss. Um, in this case, this entire truss is made out of a round steel tube and the joints are fairly complicated because they not only have to be cut on a miter, but the miter has to be coped or cut on a curve. And sometimes they're actually mitered in two locations. So this member is mitered to fit to the bottom cord. 
it's also mitered to fit with this other web member and uh, it's coped on both of those connections also and then the end of that uh, tube is welded all the way around to seal it off and make sure that uh, no water gets in there that could cause uh, long-term corrosion. In this case, by the way, you'll notice these members, the long members are actually in compression. And again, we normally wouldn't do that, but since we've made this out of such large diameter tube, we have absolutely no fear that there's going to be buckling in that member. And the people who designed this felt that that gesture was a pretty important gesture um, in terms of creating this cantilever and reaching out over the space. And so they chose to line these members up. This is the interior of that, and you'll notice whatever they started on the outside, they just continued on on the inside um, in that all these web members are sloping in the same direction. And that wouldn't be the orthodox way that we would normally do it. But clearly, uh, it produces a rather interesting effect in that all these sloping webs going in the same direction appear to be marching outward in some sort of uh, unified gesture. It's a very nice and a very stable kind of structural configuration. And this is a little off the topic here, but this is a very interesting wall. You'll notice it's got glass mullions which cantilever down to that point and other glass mullions that cantilever up to this point, which is a way of allowing at least one bay of this glazing to be simple span with no mullions supporting it. It's a rather odd and unusual way to do this. Normally the glass mullion simple spans from top to bottom and if it gets sculpted, it's sculpted so it's, it's thicker near the middle and thinner near the ends. Here's another example of this kind of tubular truss. This is the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. So we have a tubular truss here and another one there and then basically no tubular truss in between. So we have at least a few bays that are completely uninterrupted glassy view. The other thing that's kind of interesting is the same tubular truss is spanning against gravity across the roof. So it's like that triangular cross-section truss just turned a corner and runs horizontally there and vertically there and there's a certain continuity of the geometry. This is another view of that space. And this is a view looking up those trusses. So here's the vertical triangular truss that's backing up the wall against wind load. And this is the truss that's running across the roof, which is resisting gravity. And this just shows a close up of that kind of detail. This joint is just mitered this joint is mitered and coped, and that joint is mitered and coped. This is, uh, I think, in the Portland airport. Um, and again, we have triangular trusses that are crisscrossing the ceiling, or I should say trusses of triangular cross-section or tubular trusses. In this case, they've done something which uh, is generally quite appealing right where the densest structure is, is where they've chosen to put the glass. And it's kind of a way of celebrating steel by saying steel can be, be so strong that we can make it very delicate and almost transparent. And in fact, we can preferentially draw our light through um, right where the structure is. And the structure becomes relatively transparent. And it's actually not a bad way to do things because the, the really insulated portions of the roof are the parts that uh, need to be opaque and the structural parts don't need to be, they can be reasonably transparent. 
Here is another uh, triangular cross-section truss system. So here we have the bottom cord and two top cords up above, there and there, with the bottom cord here and the triangulation that's occurring in this manner. And by the way, this is uh, a modified Warren truss because we need more points of support on the top because the glass can only span so far. You'll notice something really odd here. They're mixing these beautiful uh, tubular trusses with a triangular cross section with classic planar trusses. Those planar trusses have some occasional cross bracing. And then they also have struts top and bottom. So they don't cross brace every bay. They cross brace every third bay. And then the truss in between, like this truss, is stabilized by the continuous uh, bottom element, which is basically finding its stability back from that member and that member. You'll notice that these tubular trusses intersect over supports. So we have the primary span and then we have the bracing tubular structure coming in at right angles. This is uh, also in the Portland airport, I think. Um, I've been through a lot of airports. At any rate, there's a curved bridge that runs from the terminal over to the parking deck. Um, and to accommodate this curved bridge, they've hung it off in various ways from this roof structure. And the roof structure is um, rugged enough and exists in enough places that it uh, is able to handle all these really odd loads that come from this curved bridge. So uh, this is a view to show you that basically the truss geometry of these primary spanning elements is the same as the geometry of these cross pieces. These cross pieces are not carrying much load. They are primarily there to keep these triangular trusses from toppling off their supports. And so these elements are much lighter than the elements in the primary spanning trusses. Let me go back and see if I can Well, I wanted to illustrate something, but I don't actually have a good photograph to show it. So, this is the American Airlines terminal. Ah, maybe I do have a view. Let's go here. Okay. So, the key point I want to make about these trusses is they're not precisely parallel cord. And in fact, they're not even straight cord. They're curved cord members. The key point though is the overall depth of this structure is whatever the dimension is between the top and bottom cord because there is no buttressing force that exists of any significance that would allow us to account for this curvature as a beneficial effect in giving us a greater lever arm. Our lever arm in the final analysis is whatever the dimension is between this top cord, which has compression in it, and the bottom cord, which has tension in it. So even though they're curved, they're behaving very much like flat cord, parallel cord trusses. The major difference is that the curve adds some grace to it physically, visually, and it also um, provides for some potential for rain to run off the uh, roof surface, which is not flat. Okay, so here we have the American Airlines terminal in New York. And again, we have the same argument. This is not even really quite parallel cord in that the depth of the truss work does vary from one end to the other, which gives it a very nice quality, not unlike the profile of um, various animal forms, 
such as um, dinosaurs, where portions of the structure out towards the tail become more slender. The structure is doing something like that, but overall it's generally pretty much like a parallel cord and the lever arm is between the top cord and the bottom cord members. In this case, you'll notice that the bracing elements are also a similar geometry. They have a triangular cross section and those bracing elements come to support or stabilize the primary spanning elements, which are this one and that one and that one. Um, those trusses are being supported at this point and that point, and this is where these secondary trusses come in to provide stabilization for the primary trusses. The support structure here is really quite interesting. When we look at the structure in one direction, these two pieces form a kind of table leg along with that as a sort of table leg. And then relative to, um, so relative to stabilization in this direction, this is table leg. Relative to stabilization in that direction, these two form a flagpole, a very wide stance flagpole. And this one forms a very wide stance flagpole. So we have sort of table leg relative to movement in that direction, flagpole relative to movement in this direction. It's a really quite beautiful and elegant structure. So this is one end where this and that form a bipod that helps stabilize this truss against moving in that direction. They also have the advantage that they support the truss at two different widely spaced locations, which uh, reduces the effective span of the trusses and reduces the forces that get delivered to the trusses, the primary spanning trusses at any given location. So, in other words, this point and that point over there on this truss are supported as opposed to one big support, which not only wouldn't be as stable, but would increase the effective span out here. Instead of spanning just to that point, it would be spanning all the way to there. This is the connection down at the base of those struts. You'll notice they have a tapered fitting this is probably cast steel, which is welded into the end of the tube, and then that weld has been ground down. Um, and this taper was just to sort of allow them to get more um, near, to get nearer to the center of this connection without all the members just sort of jamming into each other. Okay, now this is not a classic tubular truss in the sense of the ones you just looked at, but it is an example of a three-dimensional truss system which is self-stabilizing, um, but it's, it's a more elaborate and interesting geometry. This is in a hotel that's part of the Orlando Airport. So you can go land at the airport and sit in a conference in this hotel and never leave the airport complex. And this is the atrium space with the giant skylight above. And it is spanning basically from one side to the other side. And it produces some rather nice spaces around this atrium. So you can sit and have meetings in these spaces and enjoy the light from the atrium. This is the uh, fisheye view looking up. So the span is from this side to that side. And what's interesting is we kind of have this tubular truss. So here we have on this face, we've got a Warren truss that goes that way and a Warren truss that goes that way. And it's modified by this additional strut here and a strut there. And then what makes it interesting is there's two more struts that go out a long distance. And here this goes out a long distance. 
So this entire glazed panel is supported off of a tension strut at the center here, which then allows compression in all these struts that are coming off of that point. So we have a whole bunch of them that are reaching out and supporting key points in this giant grid of glazing up above. So the primary tension member is this double strap along here with a field connection with many bolts at that point. Uh, we have a compression member here that comes down to this mediating hub and then all of these things come off of that. So it's a very multi-dimensional kind of structural system that provides extensive support for the grid of beams up above. This member comes down through here and the primary tension member on the bottom, the bottom cord is the strap that goes around that. And this is the connection at the center, which by the way is fine tuned by adjusting these bolts that go through it. And in the final configuration, there's still a gap there, which was intentional in order to assure that they can have full adjustability of that joint to get the geometry exactly the way they want it. That ends our video on self-bracing trusses or trusses with triangular or tubular uh, properties, which can have either triangular or rectangular cross sections.